Alrighty then, hey guys, what's up? I believe that the stream is up and operational now. I'm Sizzant, or Grant if you prefer, and welcome to what is going to be a live leather crafting tutorial. So in my regular videos, I kind of gloss over a lot of the fine details of a lot of the techniques that I use, and that's because it's really easy to get bogged down in the weeds with stuff like this. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take a while to show you a lot of the techniques in a lot more of an in-depth way. And if you have questions, just go ahead and ask them in the chat and I shall respond to them as best I can. Hello everyone who is viewing me live. And if you're watching this video at a later date, how dare you? All right, let's have a look at the workbench. So the previous, if you've joined me previously for a leather crafting stream that I did on Twitch, I was just working with some scraps and I thought that it might be a good learning opportunity to show you this is the kind of thing that you can make with a few simple techniques. Now I maintain that knowing any material, knowing how to join and adhere two pieces of that material together, you can make, you can make an incredibly wide variety of things. And so this is a Kostrup, this is a leather drinking vessel. I won't be showing you how we go about the shape or getting it solid with beeswax, but I will be showing you how you can go about cutting out the shape, how you can go about getting stitching like this along the sides of it. And I will certainly be showing you how you can go about getting a nice glossy finish on the edge right there. Oh, welcome. Thank you for coming along. Um, okay, so we're going to cut back and forth with a lot of things that I've prepared earlier. And the first thing that I'm going to show you is just the pattern that I have made here. So for our costral, it just needs to kind of be a rough bean, beanie kind of shape here. A lot of them are a bit more kidney bean than others, this sort of angle down the bottom there. Now, I've just scribbled this onto a piece of A4 paper just for the sake of completion. The only, uh, the only thing that you need to do would just be to fold a piece of A4 paper in half, grab a pencil and just absolutely go your hardest. So mine is about the size of an A4 piece of paper. If you're making one to a similar size, you can expect it to hold about 400 ml of water. If you go through the whole process, and if you do wanna go through the later stages of the process, I will be uploading a video on YouTube as to exactly how I made the entire costral. Let's get back into it. So, that's all it needs to be. We're going to gloss over a lot of detail here. And as you go through the process, you'll see how it's not a precision process, but you will be able to get a nice professional looking uh, finished product at the end of it. And then with the fold I'd over A4, it's just a matter of, where is that? Wrap my arms around the tripod here. So you can see I'm not too worried about being exactly on the line. Yeah, I didn't like how square that was, so let's round it up here. Marvellous! So that could be something that we make a bottle out of. You know, you sort of want a few things like a flat top on it. Um, now, because I am making all of these bottles the same, I will, of course, be using the same pattern that I've got here. So the next thing that we will need is the lever itself. What I'm going to be using is four millimeters thick veg tan leather. There are a lot of different types of leather and a lot of the techniques that I'm going to show you, pardon the noise, a lot of the techniques that I'm going to show you can be used for veg tan or chrome tan leather. But what we're going to be using is a nice sturdy piece of veg tan that I have left over from some other projects. And the reason that I'm using veg tan is because this is a drinking vessel and veg tan you can seal and make waterproof with beeswax. So for me, it is simply a matter of laying the pattern down. Where do I want to cut this out of? Right about there. That looks good to me. Now let's see if we can get you um, down into the action a little bit better.
There we go. So I'm just going to use my various workshop nonsense that I've got laying around to weight the pattern down. And if you are looking to get into leather crafting and you're looking for some cool specialty tools to buy, check this out. This is a silver pen that Schneider make. The silver is great because it shows up equally well on pale hides as this and dark pre-dyed hides. And because of the way that you bevel the edge and treat the edge, you'll never see this on the face side of it. So, all I'm gonna do is just roughly trace around these. Whoops. And I'm just moving my fingers along the edge of the pattern because normally I would hold it down a little bit more tightly but having to work around a camera you know so you can see we've got a nice shiny little outline there and I'll just make a corresponding second outline around about here-ish I reckon You'll notice that this um, leather has a bit of shape to it, a bit of three-dimensional shape. So if I zoom us back out, you can see it sort of is forming up in these little lumps and we will take care of that with the next step. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, let's quickly trace around this. That's one of the other things that I love about these silver pens. It is a ballpoint. It goes on very easily. I have just a nice thick line. I used to use pencils for a lot of this stuff. And I mean, like you struggle to get it on there as a decent solid mark. You struggle to see it. Blah, blah, blah. I feel like I'm one of those people in infomercials who is like creating a problem so that I can solve it. But this has solved the problem that I created for myself. So. <clears throat> next step, let me put some water on this. The next step is cutting the leather. So this is the first sort of big operation that we're going to do. And I'm going to put some water on this and as it soaks in, I'll explain why we're doing that. What I am using for the water, as you can see, is just a little scrap of calico that I've had soaking in my bowl here. So I'll just squeeze that out. I don't want it dripping, dripping wet. And I'm just going to put this on here with a circular motion. I don't want any harsh lines where it goes from wet to dry. We just sort of want a big, messy, globby kind of pattern over this. Flip the rag over. All right. Great, now I get to get... Now I get to do my spiel about leather and the kind of material that it is. So, leather is a non-homogenous fibrous material. What that means is that it is a fibrous material and the fibres aren't uniform. They're kind of all over the place. When we put water into it, what we're doing is we're letting those fibres sort of like swell right and so rather than just sort of being all skew if when they swell up there's less room they bump into each other they all tend to align in a much more similar kind of direction that enables a lot of cutting operations especially with something thick like this we want for the cutting to go as smoothly as possible if you're cutting it thinner stuff like if you're doing um say book binding or working with garment weight leather or goat hide or chrome tan or you know stuff that you would find in an op shop like old leather jackets you can just get into that with an X-Acto knife and there's no problem. For big thick leathers like this, we do want that water to soak in through the top and get down into the core a little bit. And you can see that in a few spots here, it's already starting to return to its original colour, which tells me that it is starting to absorb into the core of the leather. There are a few other ways that you can test it, but let's not get too far down into the weeds because we do still need to cut these out. Where am I? Um, oh God. There's not a lot of room on my desks at the moment because my life is creative chaos. Okay. This is a strop. This is a bit of wood with leather suede side up on one side with some jeweler's rouge on it and skin side up on the other side. 
let's just push this aside for the moment because what I want to show you is that especially when we're cutting thick leather like this we want to make sure that we are using a sharp knife there is nothing more dangerous than a blunt knife and the knife that I will be using is my round knife otherwise known as a crescent knife otherwise known as a head knife and you can see why it is crescent and round shaped I don't know why it's called a head knife that's something that I should look up this is one that I bought from some makers on Etsy and before I use it for something like this, I like to sharpen it. There's a technique to sharpening round knives and I'll show you that roughly now. I want to start about a third of the way up the curve of the blade and I want to push it away from me. And when I pull it towards me, I want the rear end to be angled up so that it is not going to scuff my knuckles. And I'm just going to go... Let's move this so we can see what's going on. And I'm just going to go back and forth on each side of the strop a few times. Now, I will say, there are a lot of people who are a lot better at sharpening blades than I am. So, if you're looking for a tutorial on sharpening blades, I would recommend that you look that up separately. But I am confident enough to sharpen my own blades in between uses. Once I've done a few side, uh, once I've done a few back and forths on the jeweler's rouge side, I'll just do it on the reverse side. Now there is a technique, of course, for doing the entire span of this blade, but I'm only going to be cutting with this part, so that's all I'm concerned about for now. When I go through my sort of monthly, you know, deep clean that I should do every month, but really doesn't happen all that often, then I'll do the whole knife. It does look kind of like a head, I guess. I got this. I got. I got this big old five head sitting up here. So like, my head is is particularly large and um, not shaped like a knife, I suppose. Now then, if you are lucky enough to possess a head knife, I will show you how we can use it to cut through the leather. You will notice I am going to be holding it with my booger hook on the side of it, not gripping underneath it. That is to keep it from wobbling and my thumb firmly on the other side of it. This round handle is parked roughly in my palm and it is absolutely imperative that at no point during the operation does any part of my body go in front of this because this is designed to cut through animal parts and surprise I'm made of animal parts and I'd prefer to remain uncut in pieces so all that I'm going to do let's try and get this as a good camera shot I'll pop that in the old back pocket <laughs> head like a knife is a good one I don't know if it's an insult or a compliment Let's straddle the tripod, get you nice and dialed in on the action. Okay. So this is going to be a matter of starting at the air. Oh, hang on. Is that in shot? I feel like that's in shot. Starting at the edge of the leather here. And I'm just going to push the advantage of having soaked this is that I should, in theory, be able to get through in a single cut without needing to go back and trace around it. And indeed it looks like I am. So as I rock back, I can go around corners more easily. Yeah, that's cutting very nicely. As I rock the knife back and rest more on the point, I can turn and do less linear cuts, whereas if I rock it forwards, there's a larger surface area of the knife in contact with the leather, and that's better for straight line cuts. <laughs> Look, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, when I say that things are made with blood, sweat, and tears. Look, there's, there's a non-zero amount of blood in some of the things that I've made. Generally try and keep it away from drinking vessels like this though. So, 
Like I said, that's rocked back now. All I'm gonna do is follow my silver line and you can see that even though this is a big old four mil thick piece of leather, this is gliding through it very nicely. Minus any shaking and quaking on my part. Oh, I haven't gone through that in one go. Come on, Grant. Do it right for the camera. Just gonna move around here so that we can Yep, yeah, that's on that's in frame. Now I want to err, of course, with going slightly outside of my lines if I have to choose between going outside or inside. There, that's all gone through in one nice cut. And I'm just rotating the piece as I need. It did wonderful. All right, let's just finish that off there so that I can put this to one side and continue a little bit more easily with this one. Now I'm just going to tidy these edges up as I start my cut again pushing in from the edge and you'll see even though I've got my hand resting on it if this knife slips through I'm going to slip through like that I never ever want to put this hand anywhere near where it could potentially slip and cut me so as I rotate it around I'm moving my fingers so that I stay behind that perpendicular line where I could potentially slip. Lovely. So then, that's how you would do it if you have a round knife or a head knife. But if you do have a round knife or a head knife, I'm guessing that you already have an inkling of how to use it. So, in the interests of making my hobby more accessible, I will um, also show you how I would do this with a utility knife, or as I would say, a Stanley knife. Put you there. <clears throat> Push this off to one side. So for our second one, I am going to get my Stanley knife, which currently doesn't have a blade in it. Because again, the most dangerous tool that you can possibly have is a blunt knife. I'm going to get a brand new blade from my little Stanley knife blade factory. Come on, there we go. And I am led to believe that American viewers will refer to these as a utility knife. Whereas here in Australia, they're known by the brand uh, Stanley. It's kind of like how in the UK vacuum cleaners are called a Hoover. <laughs> that is true. I am not a vampire, uh, despite how, despite the, um, impression my complexion might put forth. So, because we are going to use a utility knife on this one, rather than pushing the knife through it, we are going to pull it toward ourselves, and I'm going to keep myself clear of strike zones in the same way. I'm going to trim this nonsense bit off of the side. Fuck me. I mean, fiddle dee dee. It's a lot harder to cut through with a Stanley knife than a round knife. But, you still want to try and get through in a single stroke if you can. It's harder to say 
If your leather is thick and you don't have the arm strength or you're not confident or you find yourself wobbling, take a couple of passes at it. It's not worth you losing a finger over. It will look better. The end product will look better if it was done in a single cut, which is why I like using the head knife because it guarantees, well, it has more of a guarantee of, a, of cutting it a single pass than a Stanley knife does. Welcome, welcome. So I'm just gonna pick an arbitrary point to start on this. Is that in frame? It sure looks like it to me. I actually haven't used a Stanley knife to make a project in anger since I got my head knife. That is how long it has been. And I've already lost the tip of this blade. go, which is lovely. I'm going to take the corner in a couple of passes. Yep, I just bit into it. Dag nab it. All right. Well, I'm just going to have to roll with those punches. The great thing about the Stanley knife in comparison to the head knife, of course, I suppose, is that you are able to do a blind cut like this, although you can do it with the head knife. I do find it easier uh, with a more angular knife that you can just sort of push right in. So again, making sure to keep my hand on the side of the knife that is not going to be in danger of a slip and strike incident as I used to call them when I was a tradesperson back in the day. Fuck. There we go. And of course, depending on what you're making out of leather, Again, I'm going to bite into this side more than once. Depending on what you are making out of leather, the edge may be more or less important because for this project, the edge is going to be on full display. But I have made leather projects where the edge is folded in, or it's covered up, or it's a French seam or it's a garment or, or what have you. So the edge isn't always visible. It's only because it's gonna be visible on this project that I'm being so pedantic about it. We should hopefully soon have a comparison to show all of y'all. That should be done. Lovely. I've worked up a decent sweat, so uh, <laughs> that may have been the leather creaking that you were hearing as the um, Stanley knife works its way through it. It's it's rubbing up against it a lot more than the um, than the round knife would be. I'm just trying to find. A decent example to show you all. Not many good examples here. All right, that's okay. Now then, now that we've got out two pieces cut out, when I sandwich them together, you can see that there are lots of spots along the edge where it doesn't quite marry up. You know, even if I shift this over so that these two sides meet perfectly, when I rotate it to the reverse side, it won't be the case. So this is never gonna 
measure up like unless you're using a clicker die or industrial machinery to cut your stuff out it's never going to match up perfectly and that's totally fine what would be the next step is gluing this now comes the question of an applicator and what I like to use as an applicator for leather dye just get out yet another knife is just a piece of scrap uh, an applicator for leather glue sorry miles away so I'm just gonna cut this at a roughly sort of 30 to 45 degree angle I'm going to use this little scrap piece just as a dauber for my glue Now then, because this is going to be something that is used for consumption, I want to keep glue away from the middle of it, and we want to put glue around the edge. So, how do you glue two pieces of leather together? I'm glad that you asked, hypothetical viewer, because I'm here to answer for you. So, I'm going to be using Leathercraft Cement. You may know it by the trade name Barge. Um, you may know it just as Contact Adhesive or Contact Cement. Honestly, they're all fairly interchangeable. I use purpose-made leather crafting cement, but I've also used contact cement that I bought from my local Woolworths, which is a grocery store here in Australia. So you don't need to get heaps specialty gear in order to be able to glue stuff. But when you're using a contact cement like this, what we're going to do is just run a... Ah! What we're gonna do is get it all over my hands because I shook the damn bottle off wrong. That's all right. That's why pencils have erasers. Anyway, I can just clean this up with my little spare bit here. And I'm just going to ever so tenderly smear this along the edge. So the thing that you want to do with leather, uh, with contact adhesives is we are going to want to put a bead along the edge of both pieces so I'm just going to use the bottle to lay a little bead down along there using my cutting mat to skid this around so that we're reaching all parts of it just one underneath the other piece. That's a shame. That is a real crying shame. Then, get you right into the action. Just going to use this to smooth it out a little bit because what we want is two nice, flat, spread out surfaces. We want the glue to have the chance to get a little bit tacky we don't want it to dry out completely, but nor do we want it to be in a completely liquid form. We want to have two smeared tacky surfaces such as this. So while this one dries, let's put glue on the second one now. Now, in my case, I know that I'm going to be running my stitches up to and including about 10 mil or one centimeter in from the edge. Ah, uh, where's some rag? There we go. There. Blair. Which means that I don't want to go any further than 10 mil in with this glue just because I don't want it to come into contact with any water that's going to be in this bottle that I later want to put in my mouth. So, oh, that's not catching that very well at all, is it? So again, we're just lightly smoothing. Now you could use like a, a card or a little plastic dauber or something for this, but I figure I'm going to be cutting up the leather and getting all these dorky little scraps anyway. They might as well be useful dorky little scraps, right? Oh, let's zoom out, there we go. Okay, we'll give this one a hot minute to dry. And then all I'm 
going to do is lay one on top of the other in the closest approximation of fitting that I can. Don't mind all those marks, that's just the sweat that's going off my hands. It's getting warm in here, how are y'all doing? So, as before mentioned, we are just going to have little ledges all along this thing where the two sides have not properly aligned. So now we get into the question of stitching and edge treatment. How are we gonna put this together permanently now that we've gotten the glue to hold it in place while we do the rest of the stuff? Great question. Where do I put my sandpaper is an even better question. Oh, there it is. So I won't take you through this whole process because this whole process takes a really long time. So I'm just gonna show you how it's done and then we're gonna to skip to one that I've made earlier. So what I like to do is use a little bit of sandpaper and a block of wood. This will let me sand down to a flat surface and a curved surface and I'll show you for how. So I just get a little roll of sandpaper, tear a bit off. And if I pull that taut over my block of wood, I now have a sanding device. So I can use the corners and I can use the flats and I can use the thin side of the block of wood to get right into the curves and sand it. Now, when I'm sanding the corners, let's pick a likely contender. Okay, this one is pretty offset. We can see that this corner is not meeting at all. I could probably trim that up with a knife fairly easily, but just by way of showing you the technique, if you move it in a rocking, motion, you will find that it removes a great deal of material. I'm just finding a way to grip this that is also going to work for the camera. There we go. So you can rock it back and forth, get in there for the problem spots as you work your way around it. You're not going to be in much danger of sanding a flat into this. And if you want to get really fancy, the way that you're meant to sand around a, um, an exterior curve like this is to bow in and then out. And that will make sure that you're not putting any undue flat pressure on it and creating flats. The way that looks in practice is that we push forwards and rock it back and forth. Of course, my grip isn't great, so that's sort of going nowhere quickly. And then for the areas along the interior curves like this, I would really lean into the fact that this bit of wood has two corners and I would just move back and forth in a fashion like this because that way the flat of the wood is never ever gonna come in contact with it. You've essentially got two rounded pieces. And hey presto, would you look at that after not very much effort, that's already looking a good deal better on those two pieces. So. Like I said, not gonna do that for this whole piece because we've already been here for half an hour and I don't wanna keep you guys for hours and hours. So, let's move right along to one that I prepared earlier. This one you can see is at the stage of having been glued and sanded. All of the edges are sanded into place. Now, if you've ever watched any of my previous videos on YouTube, you'll know that the most satisfying part of leatherworking is coming next. We're going to bevel these edges. What's an edge beveler? It's this little guy. It's this weird sort of curved 
hoof looking thing and the only sharp part is right in the middle of those two prongs so we're going to put this on the corner of our leather and we're going to push it along and the reason for that I kept this as a great example is because in the sanding process we have mushroomed these edges out considerably so you can see how much those edges are sticking up we don't want that we want this to have a flat edge and so to do that we're going to put a 45 degree chamfer on it with this little guy 21 questions oh great question uh demi point creations so talking about different kinds of leather um how is kangaroo leather different than the other leathers that I use. Most of the kangaroo leather that I use in practice has been chrome tanned. Now, I talked briefly about chrome tan and veg tan at the start of the video. What does that look like in practice? Well, here's a bit of chrome tan kangaroo hide. So you can see that next to the veg tan, obviously this chrome tan has been colored, but it's also quite glossy. And if I were to put water on it, the water wouldn't absorb all that much. What I have used kangaroo hide for on my projects is edging because it's really, really good. It keeps a lot of its tensile strength when you cut it quite thinly. So let me grab you an example. This is a gauntlet that I made for a Witcher cosplay. So this and this are both four mil thick cowhide on the bottom side as well. It's quite thick. You could use it for LARPing or SCA fighting probably. The, um, the black dyed part has a raw edge. However, you'll see the orange dyed part has an edge that is fold it up and runs all the way along it. That edge is kangaroo hide because I know that if I cut a long thin strip of kangaroo hide, it's very malleable. I can form it around this and it's never going to rip and tear on me. I can stretch it quite tight. Um, I haven't done any book binding yet, but I imagine that if you were to do book binding, it would take to that quite well because it's very, very hard to tear. And this is the anecdotal sort of thing that I always say. That's why they use it when they make whips. If you see bull whips that cowboys use in rodeos and whatnot, those are almost always made from kangaroo leather because it has incredibly high tensile strength, even when it's cut very thin. So that's the answer to your question. Structural stuff made out of cowhide. The um, the trim, the, the, the stuff that gets stretched, I made out of kangaroo hide. Um, it's a lot thinner, a lot easier to work with, a lot more like garment weight stuff. So that's just one example of what I've used it for, plus a few more hypothetical ones. <laughs> now then. <laughs> yes, indeed. It is ASMR time. Oh, that's a, that's a great idea. Let's move the microphone right in. <sighs> okay. Let's get this done. So the way that we do this is we just park the beveler on the edge, and then I'm simply going to... Please tell me that's coming through the microphone. That is just the most satisfying thing in the world to get a nice curl going. I'm trying desperately hard to keep this in the camera shot. It's time for me to reveal some of the secrets about YouTube. I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell them. I'm going to I'm going to reveal our secrets for for the for the great unwashed masses to know. Normally, normally I just set the shot up, get a few seconds of really good footage, and then I get the camera out of the way so that I can do the rest of the process without needing to like <laughs> lean over all of my shit. Um so, you know, here, here you get to see how the hot dog is made. I hope you're enjoying it. Dope. Okay. That's 
still got a lot more cleaning up to do. But I'm just going to quickly do down one side just so that you guys can see uh, sort of the difference. So this side I've completely done now and you can see how that's very rectangular up and down. When I hold it at the angle you can see that there's no shadow from the curl. Over here where I haven't beveled it yet you can see that shadow from the curl, that lip that's rising up. This side's been beveled, this side hasn't. So you can hopefully see that ridge that's poking out. That's what we're trying to get rid of when we're doing this edge beveling. <laughs> yes, that's right. How very dare I. All right, let's get this finished off. Now then, stitching. How does one do it? <sighs> what is it like? Um, this is the cheap cutting board that I use as a punching block. That side's pretty ruined. Now yeah, let's use this side. And I am just going to put some more water on this and you'll see why very shortly. Because like I said, I like to make sure that my leather is nice and damp for cutting operations. Now, to stitch leather, it's not like sewing fabric. You punch the holes separately and then come back around with the needles. You don't poke holes in it with the needles as you go. Leather crafting needles are actually very blunt. Look, here's one of my needles. I can poke myself with it all day. So consequently, because we're about to do a cutting operation, I'll just moisten that down. So what I'm going to want for this particular piece is two rows of stitching that follow the outside of the piece. You can do this in any order really, but I'm going to go from outside in because why not? Okay. So what I shall be using is a set of wing dividers and to make sure that all of these costrels are similar, as similar as can be, I want them all to look like they're from the same set, I'm just going to calibrate them on the edge of the costrel that I already have. That's decent. Yeah, that's fine. Again, if you're coming to leather crafting from like a hard material, like um, metalworking or even woodworking, right? Where you're working with rigid stuff and you can really sort of dial in down to the millimeter. Um, the leather is a soft material and there's, there's no need to uh, get overly invested to the point that you're worrying about half a millimetre here and there. Lots of few millimetres between friends. So, just push this aside for the moment while I score my line. I want to stay away from the neck of the bottle because that's, you know, that's where the, um, that's where the water's going to come out. If we didn't, if we didn't, if we didn't have a neck for this bottle, it'd just be like, I don't know, it'd just be a rock really. Uh, so about there-ish I reckon. And I'm just using the edge of the leather, I can't see that from there can you? Just using the edge of the leather to guide the calipers down. Come on, 
Come on, camera, work with me here. Oh, that bottom came out a little bit lumpy, but you know what? That's all right. Once it's being used as a uh, water bottle, the whole thing's going to be a big lump, so... Now comes the loud part. What I am going to use to punch the holes through it. Oh, I was gonna say, if you are wanting to get into this and you're thinking to yourself, Jesus Christ, Grant, that is a lot of specialty tools that you've gone through. What do you think I'm made of money? I don't, sorry. You don't need all of this stuff. That's why I showed you the Stanley knife. And indeed, you don't even need wing dividers. If you've got a steady set of hands and even a very short thumbnail, you can just prop your thumb up against the edge. Yeah, I'll even do it on the reverse side so that you can see. You can just prop your um, finger up against the edge. And when it's damp, When it's damp, you can see that it quite readily takes a mark from any hard surface that has been on it, even a thumbnail. So if you don't have all of this specialty crap that I've got hanging off of my wall, don't even sweat it. There's always a way around it. And if you don't have... Come on, where are you? If you don't have a pricking iron like this... Um, I know that a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of leather crafters who do PDF patterns for sale over the internet have holes that you can do like with a drill or um, just with like a really sharp chopstick or like um, I've used a kitchen fork to make a coin pouch before. Actually, hang on. This coin pouch, actually. Instead of using a uh, instead of using a leather crafting fork, I used a kitchen fork because you don't need all of the specialty stuff. Obviously, a kitchen fork wouldn't make it through our absolute unit of a thick piece of leather here, so I will be using the um, right tool for the job. But just to say, don't sweat it. <laughs> That's so true. That's Lumpy adds character. You know, this piece is going to tell a story. And leather isn't a perfect material. This used to be a living thing that was alive. It, it has marks on it. It has a, a, a pattern to it. It tells a story. And the next part of the story that this is going to tell is being a drinking vessel. You know, I'm going to put some art on the front of this. Like, even, even this finished piece, you can see, like... It's got this beautiful, like, grain pattern running down through it. It, it it's, I, I, look, leather crafting is a huge umbrella term, means a lot of things to a lot of people, but I genuinely don't understand people who go in for, like, the super, like, bougie, like, Italian-made, like, absolutely homogenous, flat colour, like, st like, you can make that out of plastic, like, why? Eh, anyway, now I'm, now I'm well and truly getting sidetracked. Oh, that's a... Uh, Tom raises the point that you can use a small set of scissors as wing dividers. Hadn't thought of that. That's another great one. Now, um, the way that we're going to use this, actually, let's get you much closer to the action. Let's um, strap in. We're going down. There we go. Okay. 
The way that I'm going to use this, oh, actually, if you have a stitching iron, so this is a four mil iron, meaning that the uh, tines are spaced four mil apart. And just by way of demonstration, if I park one of the tines on the edge and one of them off of the edge, I can score myself a four millimeter line with that as well. You can use whatever you have laying around is my point. Anyway, I'm gonna start at one end and all I'm gonna do is park that down and then place the tine closest to me on the edge. I always want to move toward myself when I am using a pricking iron such as this. I'm gonna be using a poly maul to bash it in. You can use any kind of hammer or, or what have you that you happen to have laying around. And I'm going to be using a synthetic bone folder just to help me pull this out without getting wrinkles everywhere. So we've got four perfectly punched holes and as I go around this corner you'll see that if I try and line it up, it's not... Oh, actually, I'm going to get away with that. Peel that back up again. So you can see that even with a pricking iron that has four tines in it, we're able to get around a pretty decent radius. And again, all I'm doing is I'm putting the furthest tine from... Cannon, seriously, what are you doing? All I'm doing is I'm putting the tine furthest from me in the most recent hole and rocking it forwards, always punching toward myself because I always want to be able to see what this closest tine to me is doing. And I'm putting the closest tine down on the line. And you can see on the reverse side that we're punching clear all the way through which is good that's what you want we want holes that go all the way through so that we can put our needles and thread through it um, so I'll do a few more of these just for uh, just for funsies And then once we get down to a straight run like this, it's going to get a lot easier and it's going to happen a lot faster. And I can use my bone folder to smooth over the edge like that as I'm going, just so that it doesn't get too deformed. Now then, you might be asking yourself, Grant, what do you do when you do get up to a radius that's too tight to turn around? You know, these, these straight lines and these gentle curves, they're all very well and good, my friend. But surely there must be some curves that a four-pointed pricking iron cannot maneuver around. And I would say to you, you're goddamn right. When it does get up to that, there are a few options that one has available. For, for example, my six millimeter spacing set, I have one four pointed prong. I have this, oh no, that's not six. Millimeter. I have this absolute unit for really straight lines. And a lot of them also come in two prong sets for getting around tight corners and even single prong sets for when the corners are irredeemably tight. In my case, with my trusty 4 mil iron, all that I would do when I get up to one of these corners, actually if I rush it, we might get there. But what I'm going to do for my tight corners is, we are going to use a, an awl to 
poke the holes for us. So it's possible to use the pricking iron to measure the holes, but then to have an awl actually poke. So again, you can see we're getting up to a nice curve here. And this four prong pricking iron just absolutely gobbles up any kind of minor curve that we throw at it. Again, first one in the existing hole, rocking it toward myself. Alright, now we're getting up to the dicey part. Oh, it's good. So this one, we may well find, oh no, that one's going to be fine, but I'm suddenly now in a place where if I put my pricking iron here, I'm not able to get around the corner the way that I'd like. What I can do is put the pricking iron in and just rock it forward enough for the next prong to touch push down at that angle and pull it back. So you can see, where's my pointer? Where's my pointing stylus? We can use a pencil. So you can see that's the last hole that I've punched. That is an impression from the next prong on the iron. And all that I would do is get a diamond section all Hopefully you can see that that sort of is a little diamond section rather than a round all. And what I can do is align the diamond section so that it is the same orientation as the diamonds I've created thus far. Hold it above. Push it down. And that's the hole that came from the all. And then I can use that hole from the all as the next one to line up with the fork, push down, create another, oh my god, focus, create another little dimple there, and then just drive this all through that little dimple. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a back and forth, it's a little bit of a frustration point, but eminently possible. I'm not going to punch the whole way around this one, because... I have another I have yet another one here that I have prepared earlier and what I would like to show you with this one is stitching and edge treatment. So we're drawing up on an hour. I'll try to make this brief so that I don't take up too much of your time. So I know that Cozy is a very busy weekend and the uh, there's a lot of content to consume. So what's going on with this costrel here Grant? You can see that I've already put white thread through both of these runs down and around here and I've put white thread on the internal run around here but not this one so this one's what I'd like to show you so let's get the stitching pony out time for me to show you yet another piece of specialty equipment that you can do without but it makes my life really easy so I'm gonna show it to you guys now, traditionally, you would use a stitching pony when you are sitting down. Alright, let's...
let's show, let's show you what I'm talking about, shall we? This is my stitching pony. So we can see that it is a, I oh, guess you can't because my big old face is there. This is a wooden clamp that opens and closes and it's got this little flat bit here that you can slap underneath your leg while you're sitting down and then this will project somewhat phallically up from your lap holding onto the piece that you're working on. I've just clamped it down to my workbench. In order to show you how we can do this. How do I want to do this? Do I want to do it down that way? Yeah, let's do it that way. So, saddle stitching. What is saddle stitching? Saddle stitching is the art of using two needles to stitch through the leather. Now, let's aim this down a little bit. I am gonna move the camera around because there are two needles and two hands. There's a bit to see. You can see I've already got my thread poking through here. It's a sufficient amount of thread and I'm gonna pull it up to make sure there's an equal amount of thread on both sides. <laughs> Thank you, I'm very proud of the amount of preparation that I did. As aforementioned, here I have two needles. These are leather working needles, they're very blunt. I don't have calluses that hard, you know. These, these are blunt needles that are made for this waxed linen thread. Actually, actually, let's show you the whole gosh darn thing. Zwoop. Here I've got my thread. Here I've got my beeswax. This will be making a return appearance. Just going to literally once, twice, thrice pull the thread through my beeswax. And then what I'm gonna do in order to thread it, here's a hot little tip for you. Get your thumbnail, pinch it hard up against the flesh of your index finger and just pull it. And you'll notice, come on. Autofocus, I'm literally begging you. So you should be able to see the end of that thread is now sort of a chisel point rather than tubular. And it should allow me to relatively easily just poke that chisel through the needle and pull through what I want. If you watch other leather crafting stuff, they'll do like some complicated trick with the thread at this point. At this point, all I do is this, boop, pinch it, and leave it, that's ready to sew. Let's do the other end. So again, I'm gonna knock the camera and give all of you nausea. And then I'm going to put a little chisel onto the end of the thread. And we're just going to put a chisel onto the end of the thread. And then we're just gonna poke that through the needle like so. Pinch it and we're ready to go. Now then. Yes, we are making a costral. So what we've done so far is we've cut the costral out, we've glued it together, we've punched some holes, and we are about to start saddle stitching now. So, what? <laughs> yeah, having I, I agree. Having the uh, two runs of thread going along here, it it you you got to stay focused to just stitch one of them at a time. So. What we're going to do is pick the starting hole, push one needle all the way through, and then I'm going to grab both of the needles. Now, when I grab my needles, I grab them by the eye so that I'm pinching down on the thread, and when I pull them, the thread doesn't go through the eye of the needle. I'm just gonna lift this up as far as it will go. Now I have equal amounts of thread on both sides, and I'm going to be doing saddle stitching with an awl. I won't be using this one because it's razor sharp, See, this is this is how you, this is how you know how bougie I am, right? The, 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 this is me showing off more specialty tools that I don't fucking need to do leather craft. By the way, I'm going to be using a blunt ballpoint awl. So this is going to be oh, that's on manual focus, isn't it? 
the way that you hold the needles and thread. Kind of important. I'm going to be holding each of the needles in my thumb and index finger, and I'm going to have the awl parked in the meat of my thumb, uh, in the meat of my palm, and I'm going to be gripping it with my rear fingers, which allows me to hold the awl and the needle in the same hand. This is why you really need a stitching pony or third hand or whatever you want to call it to do this is because, um, yeah, kind of, kind of really need three hands to do this in addition to the stitching pony. But anyway, the way that we do this is stitching toward ourselves. These holes are a diamond section and what we want, like what you can see here, is actually let's rotate you to get a bit of a better view at what has come before Skirt. can we focus ah oh, hell yeah we can so you can see here that all of our chisel holes are slated in this direction diamond section going back to down and toward me from the top point all of our thread is going the other direction from the top of this hole to the bottom of that hole then from the top of this hole to the bottom of that hole top of this hole to the bottom of that hole this is all aesthetic this is all preference this is the way that I like it to look so that's what I'm showing you um, that's the only reason that it's a tutorial obviously if you don't like it to look this way there are a million other ways that you can stitch like that anyway back to where we were in order to get it to look like that, what we're going to do is stitch towards ourselves and we're going to repeat the same process for each stitch hole in order to give a nice um, consistent look to the stitching. So, we start off with the awl. The awl goes through the next hole. I'll show you the reverse side in a hot minute. On the reverse side, I will push the head of my offhand needle back through with the point of the awl. I'll take my dominant hand needle, put it away from me, put it behind the offhand needle, pull that through. I will pull this toward myself and down as I push my dominant hand needle through. Then on the back, we'll show you this later, I put a little loop around, I pull, I'm going to pull my off hand up and away, I'm going to pull my dominant hand down and toward because that's the direction that the stitch is going in. And you can see that just like that, this thread wanted to stay in this corner this thread wanted to move up to this corner. So we'll leave you zoomed in. I'll do a couple stitches. We'll switch you over to the other side. I'll give you a couple of viewpoints of this. So let's turn this up a little bit so you all can see. That's better. That's nice. Almost like I've used a camera before. All goes in. Needle comes out. The reason that we push this needle on the opposite side is so that it, I physically can't now push this through on the wrong side. That's just kind of like a mnemonic. Is it a mnemonic if it's a physical thing? Dominant hand needle goes through, loop, swoop, pull. And you can see as I'm pulling it, the thread is getting pulled through to the top while this thread is getting pulled through to the bottom and we're already starting to get some nice, clear, diagonal lines going in the opposite diagonal to the stitches. So once more, all goes in, needle comes out, putting it through on the far side. So we're making sure that both threads going through the same hole are crossing through on the correct side, pulling toward myself on the dominant hand and away from myself on the off hand. You can through, see we've got three nice little diagonal lines. Let's switch you over to the, to the off side, to the reverse side, if you will. Oh no, all the lighting is set up on the wrong side. Um, how are you going to solve that, Grant? Um, if 
I can solve that by turning the exposure up. Oh my god, I'm a genius. Okay. So let's focus. Alright. So, from the reverse side, what I'm going to do, get my all. Oh, wrong all. My all's runneth over. Going to push the all through. That's the all. I'm going to take my offhand needle. I like to rest it sort of against there. And as I pull my all through, I can just push the offhanded needle through. Now I'm going to push the main hand needle through. And as it comes through, I'm going to put a loop over it. This is called casting the stitch. This is mostly cosmetic. It's not necessary, but I quite like the look that it gives and it's muscle memory for me at this point now. So as we pull, you can see that it's sort of looped over itself and that'll sort itself out. That's the beauty of it. All I got to do is go up and away with my off hand and down and toward with my dominant hand. Bada bing, bada boom. We'll do that one more time from the off side and then we'll give you a nice overhead view so you can see both sides simultaneously. All goes through. Needle follows all. Dominant hand needle comes through, cast the stitch, pull up and away, down and toward. The purpose of casting the stitch, as you can see, means that even on the reverse side, we're getting those nice, clean, crisp diagonal lines. If we weren't casting it, then you would end up with a little bit more overlap on the reverse side, which isn't the end of the world. Technically, it's more likely that you will pierce a thread and tie a knot if you don't cast it, but I've always maintained that it's mostly aesthetic. All right, let's have a look here. Let's get you up and above looking down. I should really turn the camera off when I'm moving it around, oughtn't I? But you know what? As we say here in Australia, she'll be right. Who else hashtag apartment life? I've just got crap absolutely everywhere. Because I don't have enough storage to put all my stuff places that I like. Okay. There we go. A almost like I know what I'm doing. There we go. So, from a top view, got my all. The all goes through from the dominant hand side. From the off hand side, we follow it. Push back through from this side, cast the stitch, pull. Blah, blah, blah. Getting sweaty hands. All right. So as you get into a groove with your saddle stitching, you know, I'll uh, readjust where it's sitting in the stitching pony so that I'm not putting undue tension on parts that aren't supported by the clamp. And you know, as you, as you go through it and sort of develop that muscle memory, you wind up in a very nice sort of trance-like state where it's only every so often that you realize and think to yourself, Jesus Christ, for each one of these motions, I'm making four millimeters worth of progress on this seam. But, you know, I find it very relaxing, honestly. I don't even put music on anymore when I get into a nice saddle stitch and groove. I just enjoy the process. So, this might be the last stitch. Unless anyone has any questions, again, if, uh, if I've rushed through something or you're not sure about something or, you know, heavens forbid you're trying to follow along, uh, fire off and I will respond. So, 
that's stitching. Um, edge treatment. That was the last thing that I was going to show you guys. So we've run for an hour and 15. Let's wrap up, try and make this a neat 90 minute segment. What I'm going to show you next, let's be professional about this, Grant. There we go. Going to get rid of the stitching pony. Don't worry, that noise is normal. Going to sort the camera out. Going to pull that up. Zoom that out. Going to reduce that exposure so I'm not burning anyone's eyes out. Lovely. Okay. Final step. So, you have cut your leather project out. You've glued everything together that needs to be glued. You've put the stitching in. The stitching's looking great. You've sanded everything, you've beveled everything. I'm super proud of you. How do you treat those fuzzy, furry edges? Because even, even though this has been treated with an edge beveler, you'll notice that it's still very furry, very fuzzy, not glossy, not smooth, not shiny. And again, personal preference, if furry and fuzzy is the look that you're going for, more power to you. Um, go and fuzz and fur your little heart out, but I'll show you how to get a smooth glossy finish if that's what you're after <clears throat> I'm so sorry for pointing out that each stitch is four millimeters apart But I think that it's better that you hear it from me than from your brain worms, so You're welcome, I guess <laughs> All right edge treatment Lot of different products, lots of different ways to do it. There's there's infinity ways to do all of this. In the words of our Lord and Saviour CGP Grey, there's no real procedure for anything, right? So what I'm gonna show you is how to do it with beeswax, a bit of wood, and a little bit of water if you want to get super fancy. And you all know me, let's get fancy together. So let's start in the bottom here. What we're gonna get is our little gross ugly bit of beeswax that has been through the absolute ringer and I'm just going to shove it on there. The friction will generate heat which will cause the wax to melt and transfer onto the leather and that's exactly what we want. We want to encourage that process of friction because what we are doing with this burnishing, the proper name of this step, this is a burnisher or an edge slicker or whatever. Um, leather tools don't have very inventive names. This is an edge slicker, you know, the thing that bevels the edges is an edge beveler. It is what it is. So we are going to get this bit of wood and we are just going to rub this. So I can see that that's the size that I want. It has indentations for other sizes. If I had a thinner bit of leather, I'd choose a thinner side. And I'm literally just going to apply friction. Now, as I'm doing this, I'm forcing that now molten beeswax into those fibers. As I was saying earlier in the stream, if you're just joining us, hello. As I was saying earlier in the stream, leather is a fibrous, non-homogeneous material. What we're doing is forcing beeswax into those fibers. Uh, as the beeswax gets hotter from our friction and from the pressure, it is getting pushed into the leather. It is soaking into those fibers and we are then aligning the fibers by way of the burnishing. So you can see that with just that bit of effort as I was talking to you, our edge is already looking, dare I say, rather handsome. So for all of you all who might have said, oh Grant, ha, oh, I scoff. That's hardly burnished. I can still see a clear line between the pieces running along. You'll see that line runs right up to the edge, hypothetical jerk. Um, that's not the line where the two pieces are meeting. That's an unrelated seam in the leather. Even just with that small bit of effort, 
the line between the two pieces is getting very blurred and that that is that that is what that's what makes it pop that's what makes your piece look professional if you want to make professional looking stuff if you have a nice bag or satchel or piece of leather whatever that you bought from someone have a look at it if you've got a really nice piece have a look and i guarantee part of what makes it nice is when you look at those edges you don't realize that it's just two pieces smushed together so firmly that you can't tell that they're two pieces smushed together that's edge treating you can put paint and stuff on it but i really like the look of just an edge that's been burnished like this so anyway i'm going to go back to it i'm just going to do this one piece um basically as far as i can get it in the next 10 minutes or so because if I try and do the entire length of the edge of the costral, I'm not going to get it finished in time. And I want to sort of kind of show you guys how how far a little bit of effort goes. Um, not trying to like shame or, or whatever, like not trying to say that in like a negative, like hustle culture kind of way. Trying to say that in an empowering way. Things that you think that are out of reach are much closer than they seem. So, so far, the only ingredients to this have been beeswax and friction. If I had some canvas to hand, I could use that as well. Yeah, let's put some more wax on it, that's starting to get in there. So, like a lot of things, this is an iterative process. We iterate the same thing again and again we get a nice, consistent look. Yep. And you can see with the uh, edges that have been previously beveled into this, they're getting included in it as well. You can also see I'm swapping from the channel end to the flat end of my burnisher every now and then. And that's just to make sure that the middle of it is being exposed to that friction and pressure as well. The autofocus is really freaking out, but I'm so sorry, y'all are just going to have to bear with me. This is a two-handed thing. And if I put it in manual focus, I guarantee that I'm going to hold it in the wrong goddamn spot. That's actually looking rather handsome, dare I say it. So, we'll call that 80% of the way there. So you can see that edge is quite dark. The beeswax, as it gets absorbed, will darken the edge. It is dark and smooth and glossy. As I move it, you can see it's catching the light, as opposed to this edge, which hasn't been burnished, which now that, now that I've shown you a burnished edge, doesn't this look like shit? <laughs> this, this is so lovely and beautiful and smooth. And let me show you a little, a little tip. I hate doing mock-ups because then it's just fabric you never get any use for. I make my mock-ups out of calico, so I can just tear myself a little square of pant. Come on, Grant, show off your big, strong arms. Here is something I've been playing with. If you have canvas, canvas works a lot better for this than calico. But what you can do is get your little leather working water bowl, not this soaked rag, just just a just a just a just a just a just a just a, just a, just a tiny little bop, bop, bop of water on it and a rag. Bit more, bit more, bit more. This this step is really movement by degrees. Anyone else remember braid? Now that I've put that water on there and buffed that up, oh my, oh my god. Oh my god. Look at that. Look at how shiny that is. Look at how much of a G, G darn mirror freaking finish that is. That's not still wet. I'm, I, like, li listen, listen. 
you should be able to hear the, the squeak as I run my finger over that. That is bone ass dry. And look at how glossy and beautiful that is. That's it. Beeswax, friction, tiny bit of water and a cloth at the end of it. This is how you make leather look professional. I swear to you, I swear to you, more than 50% of the difference between leathercraft that you look at and say, that's amateur and leathercraft that is professional is the edge treatment. It's those little details that just make the whole thing go and you go, ah, and you don't realize what's making you go, ah, until you look at it and you look closely and you say, it's, it's all these little details. It's all these little pieces. So thank you so much for joining me. If you have just arrived, we have been working through making a costrel. This is what the finished product is eventually going to look like. This is a drinking vessel that is sealed with beeswax. I will be going through the entire process of making one of these from top to tip on my... I should, I should, I should have put some water in this so I can drink out of it. Hang on a second. Am I going to be able to pour this in without getting water everywhere? Nailed it. So you can see that with the beeswax on it, it is completely watertight. <sighs> and I will be going through the entire making process for this costrel later on on this channel. I will be doing a detailed, shorter form video that will give a tutorial in saddle stitching because I know that this one has been going for nearly 90 minutes now. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Let me put that down. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I really do hope that... I really do hope that you guys got something out of our time that we spent together today. I hope that you enjoyed watching me carry on and swear a little bit, and I hope that you learned something or that you enjoyed the experience, and I hope that you guys go on to enjoy the rest of Cozy. It's not over yet. I know that there are a lot more, um, I think there are a lot more live panels and a lot more premieres that are scheduled today in addition to all of the Instagram events. So thank you so much to everyone who has been involved in Cozy. All of the organizers, all of the schedules, all of the badge fairies. I don't have badges for this. Sorry if you're into badges, but I didn't do it. There are so many people who've put in so much hard work for this event and there's so much content for you guys too watch. So again, thank you very much for joining me. You guys take it easy and I'll catch you next time.